Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for our webinar titled Open Access, What Researchers Need to Know Now. This is Haley Culleton from Inside Scientific and I will be your host for today's event. This is the first of many professional skills training webinars from the American Physiological Society to come and will feature industry professionals defining what it really means to publish open access, the different types and the factors that influence funding. They will also share how to manage related fees from grants and budgets from the perspective of a scientist. First, we will hear from Lisa Hinchliffe, Professor for Information Literacy Services and Instruction from the University of Illinois. She will give an overview that defines OA, outlines the different types and the benefits to authors. Next, she will dive into who is responsible for covering the costs of OA publishing and explain transformative agreements. Following, we will hear from Dr. Dennis Brown, Professor of Medicine at Harvard University, Director of Massachusetts General Hospital, and Chief Science Officer for the APS. Dr. Brown will share examples from scientists around the globe who have published extensively in OA models to learn how they handle related fees from their grants and budgets. He will also share the available options to APS authors. Good morning, Lisa, and thank you so much for being with us today. The floor is yours whenever you're ready. Great, thank you, Haley, um, and welcome to everyone to this webinar. I'm really pleased to be able to provide this overview of open access and what researchers need to know, especially if you're just getting started with this area, which I know can be complex, complicated, and sometimes confusing. I want to share a little bit about the background that brings me to this topic, as well as um, the URL for my personal website and where you can find me on all the social media, particularly on Twitter, if this interests you. I'm an academic librarian who's also held appointments as a faculty member throughout my career in both community colleges, comprehensive universities, and Research One universities. I was president of the Association of College and Research Libraries in 2010-2011, at which time we flipped our journal to fully open access um, with a no author pays model. We'll talk more about that later. I also currently am the editor of Library Trends, which is a hybrid subscription journal published by Johns Hopkins University Press. So I have experience with this as both a scholar and an editor, and I'm also a author at the Scholarly Kitchen, which is the uh, trade publication of the Society for Scholarly Publishing, where I write about many of these topics. <laughs> so before we talk about open access, we need to make sure we understand library subscriptions, because that is how the journal ecosystem has been funded for many, many years. And the changes that we're seeing moving to open access are really best understood by this previous history. So let me start by saying that while libraries did occasionally provide, uh, subs get, did subscribe to individual titles, and while we did occasionally do those direct from the publisher, most of the time we got those in the print world via a subscription agency. So there was an aggregator that um, managed library subscriptions to print copy. So this is a little different than if you were a personal subscriber. What happened in the internet age or the digital age is that we moved from buying print copy via a subscription agency to purchasing packages mostly directly through a publisher. Those publisher title packages are sometimes called the big deal, where we, a library will subscribe to all or most of the journals that a particular publisher offers. So, but in many cases, libraries also license a subset of the collections. Then we do have some electronic content that comes through us via a platform or an aggregator. And two examples that you might be familiar with are Project Muse and EBSCO. The point being is that in this world of subscriptions, subscriptions were payment to read articles and thus only those who were paying a subscription had access to read. The subscriptions that library paid by and large funded the scholarly journal market and um, as a result, obviously, certain libraries had many more subscriptions and thus certain researchers had many much more access to certain titles. Um, libraries would work hard to seek out the quality publications within the fields that they collected with, of course, some libraries, as I mentioned, being able to collect a greater variety of journals than others. 
this had a weeding out effect where only those journals that were deemed quality enough for the library market were actually able to make it in this subscription world. What we are currently experiencing then is a movement from subscribing to read, for example, here in the big deal where libraries buy all the electronic access to content to the reality of the internet in which it seems that we could have a different model where rather than subscribing to read, reading is available freely to everyone. And that is the vision of the open access age. I've put on the screen here a quote from the Budapest Open Access Initiative, which was first promulgated in 2002. And I think one thing that's important to realize here is that this has been going on for quite some time. We're nearing the second decade anniversary of this statement, which points out that we have an old tradition publication and a new technology, the internet, and that it would be possible to post electronic copy of journal articles online without a subscription barrier if we could come up with a different way of funding this system. Obviously, we can imagine the great things that could come of this. You know, everyone having access to the literature could accelerate research, make education better, um, address inequities in access to information, and, um, you know, have a, a more global conversation based in the information access that people have. This definition of open access has become sort of the touchstone or canonical definition, though I want to point out that open access is not a legal term, but rather a term that has emerged out of a community of practice. And so there is debate about what is real open access versus not, um, and we'll try and unpack that a little bit. The Budapest Open Access Initiative, however, had a particular definition in mind, which meant that it was freely available on the public internet and that people would be able to read, download, copy, distribute, print, search, or link, crawl them for indexing, pass them as data to software, or use them for any other lawful purpose without financial, legal, or technical barriers other than those inseparable from gaining access to the internet itself. Now, I do want to point out that that last phrase, other than gaining access to the Internet itself, does elide a particular challenge that many parts of the globe experience. Gaining access to the Internet can be very difficult um, for both political as well as infrastructure reasons. But setting that aside, um, as it does in this statement, we can see that it, open access was defined as more than just free reading but actually a lot of other things. And also the notion that people would not have to, you know, log in or declare um, who they are. It could just be available to them. It also made a statement about the role for copyright, which is giving authors control over the integrity of the work and the right to be properly acknowledged and cited. At that point in time, we had no regime for indicating how that was going to be marked. That has come into play since then with the Creative Commons licenses, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about those as well. And those licenses basically take copyright and then state that there is public use available for this content. So, of course, we've seen a lot of motivations to move people towards publishing open access and adopting this new model. Sometimes it's done because, if you will, somebody makes me. Particularly, a number of people are very aware about funder mandates. And if you've heard about Plan S in Europe or the White House mandate, the Office of Science and Technology Policy mandate that is being discussed, these are the kind of funder mandates we need. We also see these coming from private foundations. For example, the Michael J. Fox Foundation yesterday or two days ago released a statement that they were expecting that any grants they received, the resulting publications, would be published open access. Some people are also motivated to publish open access by the current citation advantage that open access publications enjoy, which is that on average, open access articles are cited more often than subscription-based closed access journal articles. People are also motivated by the chance to contribute to social progress and the kinds of things that were mentioned in the Budapest Open Access Initiative Statement. 
And I also think there are people who are motivated by the fact that open access means that practitioners in a field that is related to the scholarship will have access then. And I think this could be particularly the case in an area like physiology that we're discussing here today, where scholars might have had subscriptions, but practitioners would not. And so you have a motivation for publishing in open access in order to create that access for practitioners. So I'd like to get a little bit of a sense of all of you with another audience poll about what motivations you might have for publishing open access. Now, the way this is going to work in this particular poll is which of these motivators most impacts your decision regarding whether or not to publish open access. I recognize that you may have one or more of these um, that motivates you, but which one is the most important or most impactful? Okay, so we're seeing that we have um, definitely the citation advantage and the funder motivation coming up here. We'll just give it a couple pauses to see how, how people are responding here. Okay, we see the greatest number of people motivated by the citation advantage with the secondary coming up, the funder mandate. So that's really great to see. Um, I appreciate seeing all of these inputs from people. And um, I do want to point out that access for practitioners is also emerging here as a very important motivator for some people. So all of these things are important in this community that we're talking with today. So. Let's talk a little bit about the different kinds of open access, because though we have that general statement, as enacted in the world, this has come out to mean um, a variety of different things. So the first one I want to talk about is, the, is at the article level. So we can have both articles that are open access, and then we can have journals that are fully open access. So at the article level, we would talk about an article that is gold open access, and typically an article that is gold open access, in other words, freely available for reading, et cetera, that is typically made possible via an article processing charge, an APC, or other payment. And that payment is typically made by or on behalf of the author. Um, the amount of an article processing charge varies from journal to journal and um, also varies um, even within publisher from journal to journal. So the amount that an article processing charge might be charged to an individual or to somebody on their behalf can vary significantly. In addition, you might see that your institution has negotiated to receive some sort of discount from the publisher on the list APC. So there's list APC and then there's other negotiated discounts or the like on those APCs. The next type of green access is green open access, which is typically when the article itself is still published as a closed article on the publisher platform but a preprint or other version is made available in an open repository, such as an institutional repository or on one of the many preprint servers like Archive, SSRN, uh, MedArchive, BioArchive, etc. The availability of that preprint may be subject to embargo. So the publisher may say, for example, that your manuscript can be made available, but only after six months or 12 months, something like that. So this is a negotiated kind of access. In addition, there is green access where after a period of time, the publisher deposits the version of record or makes that version of record open on their site. But again, after a period of embargo. These first two categories are widely considered, um, if you will, true open access. Uh, people say all kinds of different things. Gold is primarily the model that's been pursued in Europe. Green has been primarily the model pursued in the United States. However, um, both are in, in play across the globe. 
there is a final kind of article open access level that you'll see discussed that may or may not actually be considered open access by many believers. And that is called bronze. Bronze open access is freed by publisher policy or practice, um, but it may be temporary um, or it may be permanent, but the publisher is under no legal obligation to the author to make it freely available. And the kinds of things that you can think of, we have a great example right now, when many publishers are making the articles that they have published on the coronavirus freely available, but they are not strictly speaking, open access articles in that the publishers could legally at any point put them back behind the subscription paywall. Now, I am not suggesting that publishers by and large do do that. Um, mostly once they open something, they leave it open, but legally they are required and so it must be treated as temporary access. So we've already talked through a couple of different things here that I just want to make sure that we make sure we understand, which is the difference between the version of record and, if you will, some other version of the article. So what is the version of record? The version of record is the final publisher PDF or equivalent EPUB or HTML copy. In other words, it's the copy that the publisher publishes. <laughs> Every manuscript has many, many, many versions prior to that. You have the first draft when you first wrote it. You have the draft after you did your own editing and proofreading. You have the draft that you presented at a conference. You have the draft that you edited then and submitted for peer review. You have the copy that you resubmitted for peer review once the editor got back to you with some desk reject or requirements that you needed to make. You have the version that responds to your peer reviewers. You have the version that responds to the response to your peer reviewers, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. The point is there's many other copies and the most important other copy and the only one that sort of has a canonical name in the community is the author accepted manuscript. The author accepted manuscript is the final copy that the author submits to the publisher. It is post peer review. It is post editorial review. It is post um, any other kind of review. It's the last time you save that Word file, that LaTeX file, whatever it is for submission. What's going to matter about this is that many funders talk about that author accepted manuscript file and they talk about the version of record. So those are the two that we need to be most familiar with. The other thing that you'll see in the open access literature is a distinction that's made between what's called gratis and libre open access. We do see cases where articles are free to access. Okay, so there's no problem getting access to read them, but they are not libre in that they are not free to reuse. So I'll take it out of the scholarly article realm for a second. Um, Many, many newspapers make their articles gratis available or news magazines. They are free to access, but they are not libre. They, you are not free to reuse them. They are still under copyright and that copyright is held by the publisher and there is no rights of reuse that have been granted to the reader. And so we really need to keep separate this notion of gratis and libre. Most of the funder mandates require libre open access, where not only is the copy open, but the copy has a license placed on it that enables anyone to reuse it in a variety of different ways. Now, I do want to make one notion as well, something I should have said before. You may be in a field where you've had historically page charges. Those might have been related to your images, your color print, etc. An APC is the payment that is made to make the copy open. You may still have page charges, 
page charges, um, or you may not. And that is really, again, at that individual journal level. But I just want to take us back and remind us that what the system is seeking to do with the open access fees is to replace the income that publishers received from subscriptions. So if in a previous world they were having subscriptions plus pay charges, they are now having APCs plus pay charges, or they are now putting those pay charges into the APC and bundling it together. But this is why I said it's important for us to remember what's being attempted to be replaced, which is that subscription that libraries pay. Um, so there could still be article page, I'm sorry, there could still be page charges even if you're paying an APC because the APC would be only in some cases for making it open access, whereas in other cases the publishers have gone ahead and bundled those page charges into the APC so you're seeing only one fee. So almost all journals currently offer at least one or more of these kinds of open access. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the journal level um, of what is a what when do we call a journal a gold open access journal versus still a subscription journal or a new term that's come into play which is a hybrid journal. A hybrid journal is a subscription journal where by default the articles are published closed for subscribers only but individual articles may be opened via the payment of an APC. And so this is why we have a hybrid situation. We have some articles only available to subscribers and other articles that are open access. Certain funders have said that they will not pay those APC charges for APCs in hybrid journals and they are requiring instead that if you want them to pay the APC that you find what is called a gold open access journal. In a gold open access journal all of the research articles are at the article level open. This is typically funded by APC or some of our other approaches, um, which we'll talk about it in a second, to paying those publishing charges. There are a few journals out there that fall into the category of platinum or diamond, they're called both, in which all the articles are gold open, but there's some other financial support model rather than APCs. So I mentioned in my opening remarks that college and research libraries had become an open access journal. It is a no APC open access journal because my society, the Association of College and Research Libraries, decided to use other revenue streams to support the cost of publishing that journal and to therefore make it free to read as well as free to publish. There are a limited number of these journals and many disciplines do not have um, many or any of these kind of platinum or diamond journals. So what we are seeing is that the funders are looking for people to publish within those gold open access journals or looking for financial models that convert hybrid journals to gold journals over time and preferably in as, as quick a time as possible. So again, I want to point out that this is all sort of operating with a lot of, all these slides say, as typically discussed for reasons, which is that there's no legal terms here. There is community of practice and emerging consensus. There are standards documents, but there's no enforcement behind some of those standards documents. So it is difficult um, in the sense that, um, People can use these terms in different ways, and so it's important to not just know the term, but to also understand the way it's being used in a particular context. So I want to talk a little bit about also some other kinds of ways that open access is being um, encouraged. We've already talked a lot about funder mandates, but I want to point out that we also have institutional mandates. So for example, at my institution, there is a mandate to provide a version of my articles into our institutional repository unless prohibited by the publisher. We see many institutions having these kinds of mandates, both public and private. 
There are governmental funder mandates. Um, these would be things like the U.S.'s federal public access policy that's been in place for a number of years. Um, in the United Kingdom, we see the REF process, the research excellence framework that really are a catalyst for open access. We see private funders, Welcome Trust, Gate Foundations as examples. We also see societies making statements that sort of encourage open access publishing. In addition, especially in the library community, there's been the emergence of a number of communities of practice where institutions and libraries commit to working to pursue open access, such as the OA 2020 initiative, the 2.5% initiative. Um, we have Plan S, which is a coalition of funders, and we have these variety knowledge sharing and the like um, practices. So while we're very prominent with Plan S and OSTP mandates, there are things happening around the globe as well that I haven't even mentioned. But the too long didn't read version is that the scholarly publication system is in flux. I mentioned already the US public access policy. Um, currently, it's a directive to national funding agencies that are makes that requires that manuscripts be open after embargo, for example, 12 months. There's heavy reliance in that on the publishers for compliance, and it doesn't prohibit immediate open access. It just doesn't demand it. We're hearing in the news the potential for a mandate for zero embargo, which would require immediate open access and would be heavily reliant on publishers to manage new workflows. But they're currently bringing a lot of input into that process. In addition, in Europe in particular, we see Plan S, which is a coalition of an international group of research funding organizations launched in September. Under that, there are, is a demand that from 2021 on, all scholarly publications that result from research by these funders must be published in open access journals, on platforms, or repositories without an embargo. In Plan S, there are three routes for author compliance. Um, we will not go into the details of all of these, but I do want to just highlight them. The first is publishing in those full gold open access journals, and the coalition funders have committed to supporting the publication fees. The third category is under some sort of transformative agreement, which is where your institution, your library, has entered into a subscription agreement that is considered a transformative agreement and then those journals those hybrid journals can be published in because there's a commitment through this transformative agreement project a transformative agreement has to do with how the library spends its money and it's where libraries commit to supporting payment to publish as opposed to just paying for reading and so we see this emerging in a number of places some of them are very large scale such as project deal in germany with the wiley agreement we also see the university of california pursuing this. Most famously, perhaps, is their cancellation of Elsevier over their inability to come to an agreement. But they do have agreements with places like the Cambridge University Press. There's also small scale projects such as the single institution agreement between APS and the Iowa State University. And we even see single journals like the JISC Digital Collections Agreement in the UK. There is a registry of these agreements if you're interested in more details. The final is this category in the middle, which is uh, agreement or compliance through deposit on an institutional repository. And here's where you'll see those two terms coming up. I've pulled it out here. The version of record and the author's accepted manuscript. In either cases, um, the coalition funders will not financially support this option, but it is a route that is available to the authors if they have other funding. So there's three routes for author compliance, but any of these routes require that the article itself or the author accepted manuscript have a CCBY license applied, which is the Libre license, and that the author retain their copyright. So we are in a time of immense transition. There are new and evolving workflows, new and evolving business models, new and evolving evaluation strategies, 
all the while we are trying to preserve the benefits of subscription publishing and the stability of the system overall. So it is an immense lift. So where can you get some help with this? I want to just show you a couple slides to show you the ways that libraries are poised to assist researchers who are navigating this agreement. So here's an example from Iowa State highlighting, for example, their agreement with APS on the read, publish, and join. An example of UNC Chapel Hill um, with their um, sort of central page where they're providing support and information about this. And finally, specifically in a medical center, we see an example from University of Nebraska where they have a whole toolkit that they've built out for their authors. So a time of great change, but a time when your librarians stand ready to help. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to um, our next speaker. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise, Lisa. And as a reminder to the audience, if you have any questions specifically for Lisa, please submit them through the Ask a Questions or the Questions and Answers box. Um, now I will also welcome Dr. Dennis Brown to take us through his presentation. Good morning, Dennis, and you can take it away whenever you're ready. Dennis Brown, I'm the Chief Science Officer at the American Physiological Society. Um, I also have an active lab and I'm a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. I'm actually the director of the program in membrane biology, not of the entire Massachusetts General Hospital, I wish. But um, So we realize this is a very important topic for many of you. And as Lisa just said, it can be confusing, even contentious in some aspects. And so we hope that the first portion of this webinar really helped you to be guided through the concepts related to open access publishing. So as we've heard, the decision to publish open access is also one that elicits a lot of discussion. In some cases, this decision process is really simplified by restrictions and mandates imposed by larger funding agencies, but also several smaller non-governmental sources, as well as by some individual institutions. In other cases, though, the decision is practical, which is the best journal for my work. How much exposure will I get using open access versus a traditional subscription-based journal? What is the impact of the journal? And importantly, what is the editorial policy of the journal? And this is where some confusion exists. So some open access journals that we know well ask a simple question. Are the conclusions of the, of the data justified by the data? Are the conclusions justified by the experiments that we've done? Other open access journals consider the innovation and significance also. Um, what I'd like to ask you, though, is not to confuse the term open access with the editorial policy of a given journal. There's a wide range, both in open access and with traditional subscription journals, um, that we have learnt about. And then there's the question of cost. Is it more or less expensive to publish open access? How much are the APCs that we've just heard about versus page charges? versus other charges. And we know that some journals publish at no cost to authors. And this is due to the income that they receive through subscriptions, advertising, etc., etc. In open access, this cost may be borne by the authors or other author surrogates. As we proceed towards an open access environment in the US, what can we learn from the experience of international and European authors whose funding agencies and institutions seem to be a little more advanced in this area than we are in the US? So with these questions in mind, we interviewed several scientists from the US and from Europe, and we'd like to hear about some of their experiences about open access publishing. And we hope that their answers help us and help you to understand the considerations involved as we move forward into this new age of publishing. And the authors that we talked to were uh, Dr. Ole Peterson from Cardiff, Joe Adams from Bristol, Rennie Bindles from the Netherlands, Patricia Molina from Louisiana State Health Science Center, and Alicia Schiller from the University of Nebraska. And then finally, we'll say a little bit about what APS is doing to in the open access environment. So each researcher was asked several questions. How often do you publish research articles? What do you consider to be a reasonable cost for publishing? Do you have specific language in your grants about publishing costs? Are there ways other ways that you pay for publishing outside of your grants? Does your institution provide funding to pay for publishing costs? And then give one example of a publishing story you'd like to share. So 
A disclaimer here is that this is based on interviews with scientists in US and Europe, and the information they provide is based on their individual experiences, and this may vary depending on the country, funder, and institution, of course. So the first person that we talked to was uh, Dr. Peterson, Ole Peterson, and Dr. Peterson is the new editor-in-chief of a new journal that the American Physiology is launching, uh, the American Physiological Society is launching in April. This journal is called Function. It'll be fully open access and hopefully of high impact. So Dr. Peterson publishes four to six annuals, uh, articles annually. All of them are published in open access journals for reasons we'll see in a minute. And this includes, at the moment, hybrid and fully open access journals. And he estimates the publishing costs for each article about 2,000 to 3,000 pounds. In the United Kingdom, the large funding agencies expect publications to be made available by open access. The grant renewals that he publishes have got to outline all the published articles, whether they're open access or not. But, and very importantly, the research excellent framework in the UK is a system for assessing the quality of research in the UK of higher education institutions and these give a score to institutions and only articles that are published in open access journals count and have an impact on the REF score. So the higher assessment that the REF framework gives an institution, the better funding they have. So there's a big incentive here for UK scientists to publish in open access. Institutional funding for publishing is provided and it's seamless from the, this investigator's point of view so the university receives the money as what's called a block grant and appropriates this money. And so Dr. Peterson mails, emails an accepted manuscript fee to the institution and the institution pays for it from this block grant. So it's not coming from his actual grant or from his pocket, it's actually coming from this extra money from this block grant. So he finds that there are difference between funders, as we all know. Smaller funders that he deals with may not require open access, but he still chooses open access in order to comply with the research excellent framework. So while he's not mandated by some smaller funders to publish open access, then it will not count towards the research excellent framework qualifications for his institution. And as we've heard, uh, because of Plan S, he's going to need to publish open uh, only as open access from the start of 2021. And this is actually going to be um, which journals he publishes in is depending on um, a transitional agreement between journals. So some journals are already open access and some will be permitted to be uh, used by Plan S if they've made a commitment and a transition agreement with Coalition S to become fully open access by 2024. So now we move to our next uh, author and this is Jo Adams. She's at the University of Bristol and currently she's the AJP Cell Physiology Editor-in-Chief. She publishes about three articles annually. All, as with Dr. Peterson, are expected to be published open access and her estimated publication costs are from 695, a very precise figure, to 2,000 pounds. The 695 figure comes as a result of her membership of the Biochemical Society, and she can publish articles open access in the Biochemical Society journals for £695. Her grant requirements are guided also by an organisation known as the UKRI, and they have a policy. This is a consortium of research councils in the United Kingdom who also require gold and green routes to open access, and they provide funding for this source. As we've heard, the green open access option can only be done in journals with a maximum embargo of six months for science disciplines. Her publication costs are also available through block grants awarded directly to the institution, and the primary purpose of these block grants are for article processing charges. But there's an unintended consequence here, is because these block grants often expire within eight or nine months of the beginning of the year, and then there are no funds left available from the institution to fund uh, open access research. So the University of Bristol, where she works, now has a process to apply for these funds, and this makes it a little more competitive. So, as I said, the fund often runs out before the end of the budget year, and then laboratories use their consumable budgets from grants to pay. The byproduct of this is to do with early career researchers. They need, obviously, to get their research published as well. 
and her lab output includes spin-off papers, as we all do, not only the high-impact papers, but also some solid research that's not necessarily as significant or as, or as innovative as most other researchers. So because of the new um, institutional requirements at Bristol, and because the block scale grants and conditions are leading to more strict qualifications for gold open access funds, she may not now attempt to publish all of the lower impact research, which is going to affect the more junior investigators. So she says that unfortunately, with the limitations of the block grant, we have now to consider whether or not to publish uh, lower impact research, and this will affect early career researchers disproportionately. And of course, this is all um, assuming that she can't find funds to publish. If she can find other funds, then this research can also be funded, but it's not covered by the main grant from the university. Now let's move to Europe, and we'll move to uh, René Bindels at Radboud University in the Netherlands. He has a high output. He publishes 10 to 15 articles annually. His estimated OA publishing costs per article are $1,000 to $3,000. He talks about page and color fees that can be expensive, but as he points out for APS members in our journals, it's cheaper and easier and we give a discount for our members. He gets funding from the NWO, which is the Dutch equivalent of the US National Institutes of Health, and they pay for all open access publishing. The grant submission must outline, his grant submissions have got to outline his publication strategy for research. We're actually going to see this more and more in the United States. For those of you on the webinar who are within the United States, the publication strategy is probably going to be a component of grants moving forward. So he sends his publication bill directly to NWO and they reimburse this expense. And he says, for how long will this last? We don't really know. Is it going to be after 2024 when the transition period for Plan S changes or not? They will pay a fee of two to three thousand dollars per paper for him. So his university is in favor of open access, but unlike some universities, it's not actually enforcing the policy. And the libraries in his university, like in many universities, are negotiating deals for publishing into the subscription uh, licenses. So these journal deals are now a top priority in taking a lot of time uh, to negotiate with top journals and publishers for us to publish, for their to, them to publish their research. So importantly, and this is, was interesting to us, as a faculty in Radboud, they're actually being asked by their university to stop reviewing and serving on boards with big publishers who are in negotiations with the library. And this seems to be some way of putting pressure on the publishers to negotiate better deals. In other words, we are being asked, or they are being asked, not to give their services free of charge to the publishers in terms of reviewing and serving on the editorial boards. Um, this is something that I've not personally seen. Many of uh, some of you on the webinar may have, have seen this. His university promotes the repository green open access that Lisa talked about. And his university, importantly, also has a data management policy that uses the uh, all the principles of data, fair principles of data storage and handling. And again, this is something that us in the United States are going to be seeing more and more of moving forward uh, data management policies. The NIH have just asked for um, information and feedback from uh, from us, from the researchers about data management policy that they're going to imp uh, imp impose. So his personal experience is this is easy. The NWO pays for open access in their grants. The more difficult one is the librarians negotiating this for us and for him, and this is going to be free to the researcher when the deals are made. And not publishing open access at the time, this time in the Netherlands is some foundation-funded research, and he says their primary goal is to cure diseases and only secondary goal is to get published. They encourage open access, these small institutions or these small foundations, but they don't require it, but they require him to fulfill milestones. So in the end, he says that his university is very professional about data management. His ideal world, and I think most of our ideal world, would be that open data would mirror the open access publishing movement, so the publications and the data would all be accessible. So now we'll talk to uh, about Patricia Molina. She's at Louisiana State University. She's the head of the Department of Physiology, and also she's a past president of the American Physiological Society. So she publishes about nine articles annually, fees of about $2,400 to $2,600, and that's the estimated open access fees that she thinks would be applicable, and she pays um, color fees and page fees. She doesn't provide an actual dollar amount for publishing in her grants, which are mainly from the NIH, but this is lumped typically into other expenses. 
She budgets about $2,000 a year for publication research in her grants. Um, in my particular case, I have a couple of R01s and I put actually a line item of about $4,000 into each of those grants. So I get about $8,000 as a specific line item for publication, but in fact, our publication charges run uh, quite a bit more than that, which we take from the supply budget. So she's not aware of any program at her institution that pays for publishing, but she's department head, so she can use departmental funds. Not everybody's in that position, and I'm assuming that she would also potentially consider the request for, for department funds for other people as well. So this is not a formal or a widespread procedure across her university. And at this time, she doesn't encourage open access publishing, but she says that this may change as we move forward. So she says that the basic science in her university is, or in her school is, is, is often the black sheep of funding. More um, emphasis is given onto translation and clinical research to the clinical researchers. But the dean encourages basic scientists now, along with clinical scientists, by providing an educational fund of $1,500 to each faculty member. And the researchers are now using this to help pay for publishing their research. So there is a little bit of help from LSU for publishing, although this is an educational fund that can be used for other costs too. So part of the reason for asking this question was uh, things that we hear from authors who say, we often use open access journals to publish less exciting or negative data, and it's important for our junior faculty to publish even when they're not able to in their journal of choice. And I think a lot of us have this, this feeling, but as I tried to point out early in my introduction, the editorial policy of a journal, whether it publishes less exciting or negative data, was initially thought to be associated with open access journals, I guess, a few years ago. But right now, the editorial policies of both open access and subscription journals cover all of this gamut of less exciting and negative data to the highest impact journals as well. So finally, let's move on to Alicia Schiller. She's a more junior investigator from the University of Nebraska Med uh, Medical Center. She publishes about seven articles annually, and she expects about $2,000 to $3,000 uh, per article. She usually publishes in non-open access, but it also depends on the content. And she has um, a, a bit of a, a different career pathway. She started off as a postdoc in the military, um, a military establishment. And so she published early work in military journals, which may not be as prestigious, but matched the research with the audience. So most of us don't know these journals. They really have a, a lower circulation around the military, but they have a higher impact, but among a very specific audience. So her funding for that came from core dollars that went to fund her research from the military. So now she's moved into academia, and the appropriate funding is more accordingly in, in, in line items in, in her grant proposal. So her first option is to take funding from her grant. The next option is to use budget line items for about $5,000 that includes meeting travel. So she uses some of that money to publish. She has no institutional funding for her uh, to help publish her work, but she often in her setting, as a, in a medical center, has rotating medical residents who not only want to publish, but are expected to publish. And so the burden falls on her to, to, to pay for the publication costs. And this, she says, is a gray area. Who should pay for this? She has a line of access to the chancellor, and she told us that she's now proposing that the university pay for these rotating residence publications to help, help her um, fulfill this requirement. And so she says, um, as for open access, she usually considers journals that have a firewall like the APS journals, but not necessarily open access. And however, the no open access fee encourages the publication process for solid science by early career, uh, career researchers, if she can find such a journal. And she says, obviously, like all of us, if it wasn't published, it never happened. So it's important for early career uh, people to, to be able to publish. So here's again related to the, to, the, to the poll question we just asked about when talking about valid scientific resources, it's easier it's easier to think about and discuss journals behind paywalls because she says, we know they provide proper peer review and reputable processes. Of course, many open access journals do this too, but with so many predatory journals, it's hard to understand and outline and find the specific journals that are safe open access journals. And I'd like to point out at this point that in your, um, in your resources, um, and I think that Lisa already uh, talked about this, there is a directory of open access journals called DOAG in which the safe open access journals, or most of them at least, are listed. 
So with that, my last uh, contribution here is to talk about the American Physiological Society and Open Access. So we're very, very aware of this changing environment, and APS is committed to implementing not only innovative, but financially sustainable business models of publishing that also enable broad access to research articles. And so with this in mind, coming soon in 2020, we are going to launch a journal called Function. This is a fully open access journal. Ole Peterson is the editor in chief. And this is going to be in addition to our other fully open access journal, which is called Physiological Reports, published in conjunction with another couple of societies. So the APS is now collaborating with librarian partners with our new transformative agreement model called Read, Publish, and now Join. So you not only get to read and publish, but also you get to be a member of the society of the APS. And finally, and we've had for many years now, we continue to make content uh, freely available to the public 12 months after publication, but also to provide author choice as an open access, uh, an open access option for authors who publish in our journals. So we're aware of the situation. This, an evol an e this is an evolving process, and um, we're keeping our finger on the pulse of what's going on. Thank you for listening. And with that, we're going to jump straight into um, our Q&A. So Lisa, if you would like to join us back on the line. Our first question um, will actually be for Dennis. Jerry would like to know, are there any grants available to institutions in the U.S. to get block grants to pay for author APCs for the, from their faculty? So uh, thanks for the question, Jerry. Not as far as I know. This is, um, it's possible that you may be able to go to, to heads of department at your particular institution, but I don't know of, of, of any institutions, and maybe people online can, can uh, tell me if I'm wrong. I don't know of any institutions that provide block grants in the US. And this is perhaps uh, when I mentioned that we could learn from our European and international colleagues. This is perhaps one thing that, that may be uh, present in the future, that, that block grants may be available. But at present, NIH certainly don't give those and none of the other major funding agencies. So I, I think the answer must be no. If I could add to that, um, though you are absolutely correct, there are no block grants <laughs> in that sort of national way. Um, if you are interested in this, I highly encourage you to check with your librarians because there are a, a, a not small number of libraries in the United States, at least, where the libraries themselves have created, if you will, sort of a local fund that um, authors can apply to for at least partial, if not full coverage of, say, one APC per year. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Lisa. Um, Lisa, actually, the next one for you. How does APC for open access differ from traditional page charges? Sure. Um, so the APC may incorporate those page charges um, in those journals that traditionally were subscription journals and then also charge pay charges. However, we also see cases where there is both an APC and page charges, uh, depending on how the publisher. So going back to my original point, the goal is to replace the subscription revenue. And so some are replacing that only by looking to the APCs and then leaving the page charges there as well. Others are restructuring to an APC focused model and not having multiple fees. So it really depends on the particular journal. Okay, fantastic, thank you. And Bernadette um, is wondering, under what circumstance would someone want to quote unquote reuse? I think this came in um, uh, earlier during the presentation. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, sure. So um, I think two things I want to just clarify. One is is um, it's what the CCBY license creates is the possibility of reuse. No one ever has to reuse it. But here's an example how it could be reused with a CCBY license. Um, if somebody was putting together a course reader your article could be included in that course reader without having to pay the publisher or you a fee for that inclusion. It also makes it possible for your articles to be included in various text mining projects where um, the copyright status is then not a detriment to the ability to include that work in text mining. So what CCBY does is it gives a blanket license for reuse without compensation. Um, 
it's not to say that a copyrighted piece can't be reused. It's just that then people would be having to ask for that reuse and potentially pay for it. So um, as an individual scholar, for example, if you wanted to write a book and in the midst of that book, you wanted to include a full journal article that was very important in the field. If it had a CCBY, you would be able to do that um, without seeking further permission or paying for it. Perfect. And in the interest of time, we, were gonna, we are going to make this last question, um, or this question, the last question. Dennis, what does uh, data management policy mean in terms of the discussion topic of open access? So they're kind of um, interrelated in, in, in as much as the data, um, the open data policy means that um, there would be repositories for um, all sorts of data sets, genomic data sets, proteomic data sets, and we're having a big discussion now about what exactly does data mean? Is it individual photographs, individual Western blots, individual physiological measurements, or, um, and or large data sets? And it's perfectly feasible to put these large open data sets online in, in either specific or general repositories before the manuscript is published. So before, um, before the work is actually published, and, and um, NIH have, have, have repositories for this as well. So in some cases, some journals actually require, many journals now require you actually to, to, to deposit data in these large repositories. We just had a paper, for example, in a journal that I won't mention, but, but it was required that we publish the uh, genomic data that we had in a repository as a condition of, um, as a condition of acceptance. And this is a kind of a separate repository that's really got nothing to do with the journal. So it's not a journal repository, it was a large repository. So what we're gonna see moving forward is um, in some cases, I think the requirement to deposit data very, very soon after it's generated even, I don't want to, um, to, to, to be too dogmatic about this, but um, even if the results are negative or even if the results are not published, you can still deposit the data. So the data deposit repositories are open, they're available to everybody, but they're not necessarily related to a publication. If they are, that's, that could be an open access publication, but it's really two separate things that have the same goal, and that's to make data available freely and quickly to everybody. Does that answer the question? I think so. Thank you so much, Lisa and Dennis, for all the fantastic information, both in your presentations and in the Q&A session. Um, for those of you who were asking, Function will be accepting submissions at the launch of the APS annual meeting, Experimental Biology, in April. Thank you so much to the audience for taking time out of your day to attend this professional skills training webinar. And we hope that you found the information presented valuable and thought provoking. The slides and a recording of today's webinar will be available soon, and the Q&A report will be posted in the coming weeks, including answers to the questions that we were unable to address today. So look out for an email or two regarding these resources in the near future. Finally, you will be invited to complete a brief survey upon exiting the webinar, so please take a moment to provide your thoughts on today's session and what we can do moving forward to ensure these events are both educational and applicable to your work. In closing, thank you again for taking part in this APS webinar, and we look forward to having you with us again soon. Have a wonderful day, everyone.